Great. So, yeah. The next speaker is Fan Wei from Princeton, and she will tell us about graph irregularity strings. The floor is yours. Oh, yeah. Thank you for the introduction, and uh, I'm very honored to speak at this conference. So today I'm going to talk about a very neat conjecture, which turns out to be very hard to prove and is still open. Okay, so let's start the motivating question with a kind of easy brain teaser. So the question is, given a simple graph um, on emphasis, is it possible that all the vertices have different degrees? And clearly the answer is no, because um, all the possible degrees are zero all the way to n plus one, but zero and n plus one cannot coexist. So by pigeonhole principle, we, we know for any simple graph, there must be two vertices have the same degree. And in that sense, no graph is irregular. So this question motivates uh, Chartrand, Erdos, Allerman, and in a survey paper, they try to explore different notions for graph irregularity. So basically their idea is um, from each vertex, we define certain weights for that vertex, and we want to see uh, whether the graph can, made, can be made irregular. And in a following up paper, Chartrand, Jacobson, Lehel, Allerman, Ruiz, Ruiz, and Saba, they made a concrete formulation of a graph irregularity uh, notion. And basically the theme of their irregularity notion is that irregular multigraphs are quite common. So here, now this is the most important uh, slide in this talk, which is a definition of the irregularity strength. So um, suppose we are given such a simple graph where um, the, the blue number denotes the current degree of this graph. The idea is that we want to blow up each edge into some multi-edges so that the vertex degrees are all distinct. So for example, we can blow up the, the green edge into two copies, the red edge into four copies, and then the yellow edge, and then the dark blue edge are both one copies. And we can count the degrees for the vertex now. So uh, for this vertex, its current, its current degree is four. We add all the weights for its adjacent, uh, for, for, the, for the edges incident to it. And then now we have all the vertices to have distinct degrees after we blow up each edge. And in this, oops, in this example, the max blow up is four because the red edge is blown up uh, four times. So the max weight is four. The question is, can we do something better? And indeed, yes. So for the original graph G, we, can on, we only need to blow up the yellow edge twice in order to make all the vertex have distinct degrees. And in this case, the max blow up is two. So here's the definition of the graph irregularity strength. It is the minimum K such that I can blow up each edge in an integer at most K so that all the vertices have distinct weights. So basically, I don't want to blow up each edge too much, but I still want all the vertices to have distinct uh, weighted degrees. And in this previous example, it's easy to see that the irregularity strength of, uh, of this graph is exactly two. And there are many other related irregularity definitions and conjectures, um, especially in the area of graph labeling and graph coloring. And this is one of the particular definition of graph irregularity strength. Here's the definition again. And what are the known bounds? So the first known bounds is um, for graph on n vertices, the irregularity strength is at most n minus one, except for triangles. It was done by Eckner and Trash in 90s and Nerhoff in 2000. And now let's assume the graph is deregular, meaning every vertex have degree exactly D and has N vertices. So what do we know about uh, deregular graphs? Faudry and Leho in 1987, they showed the irregularity strength for deregular graph is at most N divided by two. So that's quite an improvement from the previous bound N minus one. And what do we know about the lower bound? Well, if all the vertex, since um, all the edges are labeled between one and K, so the smallest vertex weight is at least D. And since all the N vertices have distinct weights, so the largest one has to be at least D plus N minus one. 
And since that vertex has d neighbors, it means there must be um, an edge with weight at least n plus d minus 1 divided by d. So this is a very easy lower bound. So it's roughly on the order n over d. By this lower bound, Faudry and Leho um, and Jacobson at the same time, they made a very broad, uh, a, a brave conjecture. So they conjecture that the lower bound is basically sharp, um, despite that they were only able to prove the upper bound to be n over 2. But they think divided by d is the correct answer. So basically, the, the conjecture says there's a universal constant c such that for all d regular graphs on n vertices, the irregularity strength is n divided by d plus c. So it basically matches the lower bound by the constant c. Um, so to get some feeling of how strong this conjecture is, because uh, we have n vertices, and if the maximum blow up weight is n over d plus c, it means uh, in the end, the n vertices should have weights coming from d all the way to n plus c times d. And we have to choose n distinct numbers coming from this set. So we have less room to move around when d is really small. So this notion is quite restricted. So this conjecture um, is, is quite strong in some sense. And uh, so this is the first progress, which is in 1987, 30 years ago. And there was not much progress until 2002, where Fried, Good, Karonsky, Funder, they proved um, the first linear in an over D bound for some ranges of D. So they proved when D is smaller than square root of N, then SG is bounded by basically 48 times N over D. And when D is larger, uh, their upper bound has an actual log N term um, for the irregularity strength. So it's not linear in N over D anymore. There's an extra term. And Kuckler and Lezebnik uh, later refined um, the previous work, the technique in the previous work. And they show that when D is larger than N to the two thirds, then he, they can prove the linear bound in N over D. Um, so till, till this point, uh, we still don't have a linear bound in N over D uh, for when D is between square root of N and N to the two third. And it was one year later, Jacob Prisabello, um, he proved a linear bound for OD um, in, a pure, in a purely combinatorial argument. Um, and uh, this is the, the first big pro progress in this conjecture. And later on, there was a sequence of works, for example, by Kol Kolkowski, Karonsky, Fender, Majewski, uh, Prisabello. Um, they try to improve the constant in front of N over D. They try to bring it down to one, but so far the best uh, best constant is four. So the and previous works were not by a combinatorial argument. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, can you please? The previous repeat? works were not by a combinatorial argument because you emphasize uh, that Prisbio has a combinatorial argument. Yeah. So the previous ones have a, a probabilistic argument together with a combinatorial argument, and uh, and then Prisbio um, he smartly uh, made one of the probabilistic argument combinatorial in order to to prove the whole range of D. And the recent breakthrough still by Prisbolo, he showed that the conjecture is asymptotically true when D is neither too small nor too big. So he basically showed when D is in this middle range, then the irregularity strength um, is asymptotically true. So you only, so it's basically N plus D plus little o N over D. So this is a quite impressive result. Uh, so this is uh, the, the previous result. So what I showed is that I was able to extend his result uh, for the full range of D. So basically I showed uh, for OD, the irregularity strength is asymptotically true um, when D is large. And, um, and we can see when D is in the range is at least log N, then my bound here matches um, what is the log N factor, log N factor here. So um, it's an improvement over the previous bound. And furthermore, I can show that when D is quite large, so when D is at least into the 0 0.81, then the conjecture holds. But I cannot prove uh, when D is smaller. Okay, 
Um, so now let me try to get some sense of the, the previous um, the previous works and the techniques that go into it. Right. Um, so let's talk about the first breakthrough by Fritz Good, uh, Karonsky, and and Fleiser. Um, so they first have the probabilistic argument. So basically, they showed if we only use the weight one, two, three on all the edges, then the number of vertices which collapse on the same value is at most six n over d. And together with the combinatorial art lemma, which um, which shows um, that the irregularity assignment the irregularity strength is at most some constant times um, this number, 6 and over d. And therefore, um, so that the place where we lose a constant is, uh, is first here, which comes from the 1, 2, 3, the number 3, and also the 6, which comes from uh, the first probabilistic argument. So basically, by their framework, um, it is impossible uh, to prove the original conjecture. And they used um, a random um, weight assigned to the graph. So basically, we assign each vertex with uniform random variable from 0, 1, and we connect two edges if they add up to, oh, so we assign a heavyweight 2 if the two vertices add up to be at least 1. So by some very elementary computing, we can show that, uh, oops, the probability that each vertex equals to q is at most 1 over d plus 1. And because if we change the value for each xi, it changes at most the number of neighbors, uh, the, the weights of the number of its neighbors. So each xi changes at most d vertex weights. And therefore, by Hofding and Azuma inequality, we can prove the probabilistic argument. But for this, we do need d to be small, because uh, that's what happens in this inequality. So this is a previous idea. And uh, let me talk about the, the principles um, the combinatorial guided probabilistic construction. So basically, again, the goal is to, we want to assign the weights to the edges so the vertices have distinct weights. Okay, so I'll try to give some um, um, ideas of intuition, intuition, in, intuition of, uh, of why their, their technique works. Okay, so first is the first attempt. We want to make uh, the vertex weights expect to be distinct. Again, we assign a uniform random variable to each of the vertex x, vi, and uh, we connect. So for each edge, if the values add up to be at least one, then we give it a really heavy weight n over d. So for now, let's ignore the, the ceilings and, and floors. Okay, so now what is the expected weight of vi? So let's look at each of its neighbor. So each of its neighbor has to be have weight between one minus xi and one. So it has probability the xi to be there. So we have xi and we have d neighbors and each of such edge has weight n over d. So in total, we have n times xi, which is the expected weight of vi. So conditioning on vi has um, the random variable xi. And this should roughly equal to i. When if we order the vertices v1 all the way to vn from the smallest x1 to the largest xn. So in this sense, we are in a pretty good shape because in expectation, all the vertices now have distinct weights. But um, how do we guarantee the vertex are all distinct? So this now this is a trick that um, uses a lot in combinatorics. So basically, we want to reserve a small buffer set in order to make the adjustments. So we have a very big set B here and uh, an S to be a very small set. So say less equal, S has size N over square root of D. And in B, we do this the previous trick. So each vertex in B are expected to have a different weight in expectation. And what we can do is because we have this, um, this small set S, and each vertex are expected to have this number of edges in S. So we can distribute the arrow terms um, using edges between this vertex V and its neighbors in S. So if we do the concentration, uh, if we compute the probability, then each edge roughly, each vertex in the previous step roughly have the arrow term being this size. And then we can divide it by its the size of its neighbor in S. 
and because s is larger than um because s is very small so this term is roughly little o n over d so that's okay because we are we are allowed some little o n over d change for the weights on the edges now we kind of make all the vertices in b to be distinct by using its neighbors in s but then we have to also locally adjust the weights in s so how do we make the weights in s distinct so this is a purely combinatorial argument um, so let me give uh, the following example to, to show how this idea works. And it's an oversimplified example. So let's assume D is very large, it's n over 3, and each vertex in, in S have degree roughly S divided by 3. And so, for example, those are the vertices in S. And um, for each vertex, so I'm going to analyze the vertices one by one from left to right. And for each process vertex, it will sit in a set, which starts with an even number and ends with an odd number. And these two numbers are adjacent to each other. So, uh, so each, each vertex sits in a, consecutive, uh, a set of two consecutive integers. And the goal is throughout the process, these sets never change. And the, ver the, the weight of the previous vertex always sits in this set, although the weight can change. So now let's assume we have to work on this vertex now, the, the blue vertex. And what we can do is for each forward edge, we allow the weight to add one word, not change. So for each of the forward edge, we do this. And for each backward edge, because we have to make the previous vertex to still have weight sitting in the original set. So say if this vertex original have weight 300, then we allow to add one to make this vertex still sit in the set. So I can add one or not change the edge of this backward edge. And now we are dealing with the, the second backward edge. And again, because um, I have to make the vertex weight to stay in the set, so I can choose to minus one or not change. So what do we have now? For each vertex that I'm processing right now, what's the number of possibility weights um, that I can get? Well, I can get basically the number of degrees in this graph, because for each edge, I can add one or, or subtracting one. And all the previous vertex, each of them block a set of two numbers. So this gives me if we plug in, in the simplified example, degree SV is S over 3, then this equals 2. Uh, yeah, this equals to 6. And this means we can do this greedy algorithm such that each set, each two integer set, appears at most six times in the small set S. And unfortunately, throughout this process, we cannot guarantee the uniqueness of all these two integer sets. But at least we can bond the number of collapse to be at most six. Now we have to refine this idea again. So basically the previous two ideas is that we make B to be distinct and uh, we make, we can separate S into six different groups so that the vertex within different groups are unique. And we have to somehow make sure that vertices in B are smaller than the vertices in S. And for each set S1 and S2, the weight of vertices in X1, S1 is smaller than the weight of vertices in S2. So if we can guarantee these two conditions, we are basically done. And for this, we were going to take advantage of the fact that S is much smaller than B. So this is because if we add heavy weights um, between the vertices uh, for edges across B and C, B, B and S, so say each edge has the um, weight n over d, then each vertex in B, it can increase its weight by at most n over d times the degree of it in S. But for each vertex in S, it got increased by n over d times its degree in B. And because as I also chose randomly, so and when B is much, much larger than S, then this degree is much larger um, than its degree in S. So therefore, by doing um, this, um, by adding the heavy weights across B and S, 
vertex in S got bumped much more than vertices in B. And for this, I can guarantee vertices in B have smaller weights compared to S. And similar, I can do the similar things for, um, for different groups in S. And um, we already noticed that um, if we do this step, it kind of messes up the previous steps of, of step one and two, because now I already changed the weights for vertices in, in the previous uh, steps. So uh, one have to carefully combine all these ideas in the correct order and uh, do the bounds um, carefully in order to make the, the result works. But those are the main ideas that lie behind um, the construction. Okay, so the con conclusion is we have a very strong conjecture which says there's a universal C such that for any D regular graphs on N vertices, the irregularity strength is the most N over D plus C, which is basically the same as this, the lower bound that we know. And I was able to extend the previous uh, construction and prove a bound for OD, which shows um, the conjecture holds asymptotically. And I'm able to confirm the conjecture when D is really large, but I cannot I cannot still prove um, the conjecture itself when it's small. Yeah, okay, so that's all for my talk. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Fun. Any questions? So why did they Why did they conjecture? I mean, an additive constant here. It seems like a very wishful thinking. No, I mean, <laughs> it, is was there a good reason to believe that something that strong should be true? I, I don't think there is a, there's a, there's a good intuition behind that. I guess they just want to conjecture something very strong because all the previous examples like uh, the cliques were complete bipartite graphs. You only need to you only need C to be like a four or five. And mm -hmm. I guess from those intuition they they conjectured for all graphs that this should be true. I see. Yeah. So you believe it to be true? <laughs> I'll bring um, up the spot. <laughs> It's, it's very hard. It's hard for me to say. I also try to uh, construct lower bound examples to show the conjecture is not true, but uh, it's also related to, to the, the, the extremal numbers for bipartite graphs in extremal combinatorics, which turned out to be a very, very hard problem. So basically, I, I don't have a good lower bound construction <laughs> to, to disprove it. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, questions? So, in terms of the smaller d, is there? Like, do you think this could be pushed further, or is there some like? Is there some fundamental obstruction of these ideas at some point in in for small d? Yeah, uh, I think uh, when we are doing the random construction, um, the hmm, what should I say? Um, so for small d, we don't have too much room so we really have to be very careful because um, the room that the vertex weight we have have to be from basically d all the way to m plus d times c so mm -hmm. when d is really small then then i think the probabilistic construction will lose too much there um i think yeah thank you So another quick question. So you, you start here somehow with the worst case scenario, right? That you have a regular irregular graph, so the weights all the same, but when you start blowing up edges, so is something do have better bonds when you know you start, for example, with a random and a Schrödinger graph, or you know somehow a better initial condition for 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 this blow up process. Uh, sorry, you are asking about what happens when uh, the graph is changed. So, so what, what happens if you start already with some irregular graph? So for example, with some adder Schrini type of graph, uh, is, is something known? So is it known that you have to blow up this uh, so that this number S of G is actually much smaller in these cases? Um, so so I think for GMP when P is constant, I or like basically when the when the maximum degree and the minimum degree differ by at most say uh, d to the maybe zero point five, then I I think I can push c all the way to five or six. Uh, but n over d is always necessary um, because because of the lower bound construction. Um, so the matter is uh, how small we can we can make the c to be. 
Um, so, so my previous analysis C is very large, maybe like uh, a thousand or something. But but for GMP, I, I can I can try to make it nicer. Yeah, I see. But, uh, but I still know whether C can be three or four or anything. Like I, I can show for GMP, it has to be five is okay. But I don't know whether two or three is fine. I, I don't know about that. I see. Any other questions? All right. If not, I guess let's thank all the speakers today and everyone for coming. It was a great conference. And I hope to see many of you in person also in not too long. And I also thank, can we thank uh, Ayazun who put in an enormous amount of effort into this? Uh, I think we should all clap for, for him because of I agree. Putting everything together it was great. All right.